As we have seen, the days that saw the unstoppable Japanese Empire as it took over the Pacific are long gone. Now the Allied forces have set forth to slowly but surely reclaim every piece of land lost to these ruthless invaders. Yet the fight won't be easy, as the Japanese are prepared to resist with the tenacity that they have shown already. Today we'll mainly focus on the new developments transpiring at the Solomons, as the drive on Munda continues, while the Japanese prepare to counterattack against Sanana. At the same time, Colonel Liversedge finally gets ready to launch his main assault on Bairocco, although this task would not be an easy one. Thus, join us as we delve into another epic chapter of the New Georgia Campaign. As you know, recently we started releasing extra videos as Patron and YouTube member exclusives. After finishing the series on the Peloponnesian War, History of Prussia and Italian Wars of Unification, Risorgimento, we will start releasing our series on the First Punic War. For the next two months, starting this Saturday, we will release six videos on this fascinating conflict. You can become a YouTube member by pressing the Join button below or the link in the description. The Patreon link is in the description too. Patrons and YouTube members get early access to all videos, our schedule, exclusive access to our Discord where we're really active, wallpapers, and most importantly, access to more than 30 exclusive videos, with new ones added weekly. Becoming a YouTube member or patron supports our work. We appreciate all the support we're getting, so thank you. In our last episode, General Wing had finally begun his main advance against Munda on July 9th, yet his two infantry regiments would only accomplish a little progress due to the difficulty of the terrain and because of how shaken the 169th Regiment was. The following day, the now far out ahead 172nd Regiment again managed to move forward a few hundred yards, but the 169th, with its 1st Battalion leading, would run into a Japanese blocking position after advancing 1,500 yards. Despite General Barker's artillery support, the Americans would be unable to clear the roadblock, and during the night, the Japanese would further reinforce this position so that they could continue to harass the inexperienced 169th. Yet more problems were also emerging for General Wing. Despite their slow advance, the American forces had outdistanced their overextended supply line by July 10th, thus forcing the infantrymen to carry supplies in and casualties out over a long trail knee-deep in mud. To solve the immediate supply problem, General Hester decided to swing the 172nd southwest to occupy Layana Beach, about 500 yards east of the main Japanese line at Ilangana. The 172nd was also to be supported by the 3rd Battalion 103rd Regiment and by the 9th Defense Battalion's 8 M3 Stuart tanks, which were to land at Leana on July 13th. On the morning of July 11th, the 172nd therefore turned south and started moving towards the shore through knee-deep mud, while harassed by Japanese mortars. By midday, the Americans had moved 450 yards when some Japanese pillboxes forced them to a halt. At the same time, the 169th was directed to push against the high ground to the north, yet the regiment would make little progress against the tenacious Japanese defenders and would have to be reorganized as a result. The following day, as the 172nd resumed its advance towards the beach and as the 169th attempted to envelop the Japanese left flank, Admiral Merrill was ordered to provide a heavy naval bombardment in coordination with the Rendova artillery and the Air Souls planes. Consequently, Merrill would take his four light cruisers into the narrow confines of the Blanche Channel while two destroyers went far ahead to a point off the Munda Bar to fire on the Kokengolo Hill area. The mission was then flawlessly executed, causing much damage to the Japanese base at Munda. On the ground, however, the attack bogged down from the start, with the two regiments becoming entangled as they tried to gain their positions. Despite this, the 1st Battalion 169th Regiment managed to gain 300 yards as it ran head-on into the Japanese positions. The 2nd Battalion, however, would receive enfilading fire from the northernmost ridge and would be unable to advance. To the south, the 172nd also managed to get within 500 yards of Leana, 
but would be ultimately stopped by machine gun fire coming from a series of pillboxes, connected by trenches extending northwest from Ilangana. On the morning of July 13th, a strong artillery and air barrage would precede the start of another outflanking attack by the 169th Regiment. Though the attack of the 1st and 2nd Battalions would be contained by the ferocious defenders, the previously shaken 3rd Battalion, now under the command of Colonel Frederick Reinke, would unexpectedly fight its way forward, pillbox by pillbox, for four hours until it secured the South Ridge. Reinke, after whom the troops named the ridge, decided to hold his position, and after beating up a series of Japanese counterattacks during the night, the Americans would finally manage to secure their hold over Ranka Hill. At the same time, with Japanese patrols cutting its line of communication, the hungry 172nd Regiment would desperately continue its advance through the mangrove swamp. Though slowly and under heavy mortar fire, the Americans would manage to get to Leana by late afternoon, successfully securing the beach and organizing defensive positions. The following morning, Hester would also land the 3rd Battalion, 103rd Regiment and the Marine tanks at Leana, further bringing some much-needed supplies for the troops at the front. To the north, however, Ranker's men would continue to resist the fierce counterattacks of the Japanese, suffering a total of 101 casualties by the end of the day, but successfully repelling the enemy. The success of the 3rd Battalion would further force the Japanese to evacuate the North Spur, which was then occupied by the 2nd Battalion. By July 15th, the supply problem had thus been sorted, but there were almost 3,000 casualties in the 43rd Division already, half of them to the so-called War Neurosis, so Hester recognized that he would need reinforcements to launch a coordinated offensive against Munda. Luckily, he would see the arrival of the 1st Battalion, 145th Regiment that day, which was immediately sent to reinforce the 169th, though he would still need to buy some time with harassing fire from artillery and airstrikes. That night, General Griswold would also arrive at New Georgia to assume command of the occupation force, freeing the overburdened Hester to take command of the 43rd Division's offensive. Immediately, Griswold would direct Major General Robert Beitler to bring the remainder of his 37th Division to New Georgia, while General Collins prepared his 161st Regiment to also move to the island. Additionally, Admiral Turner was finally relieved as commander of the South Pacific Amphibious Force as he was ordered to take command of the Central Pacific Offensives, thus getting replaced by Admiral Wilkinson. July 16th and 17th would see some small attacks supported by tanks against the Elangana Line, yet a lack of tank infantry coordination would only allow the 172nd Regiment to extend the beachhead to Elangana Point. Nonetheless, the tanks would be able to destroy many pillboxes before staff officers from Rabaul arrived to instruct the Japanese in anti-tank tactics. Consequently, by July 18th, the defenders would be able to disable two tanks with a mixture of mines, flamethrowers and Molotov cocktails, therefore forcing Griswold to withdraw his remaining tanks and to also request the transportation of the 10th Defense Battalion's tanks. Meanwhile, on July 16th, the 1st Battalion, 169th Regiment, advanced to the southwest and proceeded to occupy Kelly Hill without facing opposition. Soon, however, the Americans would face wave after wave of Japanese counterattacks to dislodge them, but despite being isolated and lacking supplies, they would successfully repel the enemy assaults during the night and throughout July 17th. In the meantime, as we'll recall, the 1st and 3rd Battalions of Colonel Tominari's elite 13th Regiment had managed to bypass the roadblock set up by Colonel Liversedge's forces. By mid-July, General Sasaki was then preparing them to launch a strong counterattack against the Americans facing the Munda defenses. His plan was for Tominari to take his forces around the American right flank, towards the East Bridge at the headwaters of the Barike River, and from there to drive through to Zanana Beach and destroy the American forces east of the river. On July 14th, Tominari then began his march to the Upper Barike, yet the Japanese had no maps, were forced to hack out a trail, and appeared to have been hit by American air and artillery bombardments. These factors, coupled with the pressure to live up to the 13th Regiment's reputation, 
saw the attackers suffer enormous losses during the three-day march even before their assault could be launched. On the night of July 17th, however, Tominari was finally able to send his troops down the jeep road to hit Hester's headquarters on Zenana Beach, which was only defended by a platoon of the 43rd Reconnaissance Troop and by 70 Fijian commandos. At the same time, the 229th Regiment launched its own limited offensive, aimed at preventing the troops at the front from coming to the aid of the Zenana defenders. If well executed, Sasaki's plan thus had the potential to destroy the 43rd Division's rear installations, cut the line of communications from Zenana, and surround the American regiments on the front lines. Tominari's attack, however, was very disorganized and chaotic, looking more like a series of raids instead of an organized assault. The reconnaissance troops, therefore, managed to easily repel the Japanese at the engineer and medical bivouacs, while the Fijians, at the command post, mowed down the screaming and yelling Japanese that rushed from the jungle in all directions. Yet the close-in, fierce and confused fighting would also see some of the attackers briefly penetrate the perimeter to destroy valuable communications equipment, though they could not prevent General Baker's artillery from laying a tight box barrage around the command post. So devastating was the artillery fire that the surviving Japanese had no other choice but to retreat back up the jeep road. Tominari's troops would then keep the road blocked for the next three days, but Sasaki's counter-offensive had essentially ended in failure. In response to this new threat, the 148th Regiment would be landed at Sanana on July 18th, getting sent to Ranka Ridge to relieve the spent 169th. With the 13th Regiment blocking its way, the two forces would skirmish in the next few days until Tominari's final retreat to the Yahata Highlands. On July 21st, the 169th would be finally relieved, and the following day, General Beitler would assume direct command of all 37th Division units in New Georgia. Griswold, reshuffling units for the offensive, set the boundary between divisions along a line 1,300 yards north of Ilangana, with Hester's 43rd Division in the south and Beitler's 37th Division in the north. Furthermore, Hester's move to Layana was paying dividends, as it allowed the Americans to build a road to the Munda Trail, thus improving the dire supply situation. By the 24th of July, all units had moved into position, so Griswold scheduled to start the offensive the following day. His plan was simple enough. Following a naval bombardment and a heavy bombing, the American infantry, supported by marine tanks and Barker's artillery, would make a frontal attack on the Japanese line. The 43rd Division on the left would take Lambete Plantation and the airfield, and the 37th Division on the right would take Babilo Hill and envelop the Japanese north of the airfield. Meanwhile, to the north, Colonel Curin's 4th Raiders had landed at Anogai on July 18th, so Liver's Edge was finally ready to launch his main assault against Bairoko. In the days following the fall of Anogai, Liver's Edge had sent patrols out to cover the Dragon's Peninsula, yet the Americans were too cautious, and so they would learn little information. For the attack on Bairoko, Liver's Edge planned to take the 1st and 4th Raiders over the Anogai Bairoko Trail and attack the Japanese frontally, while sending the 3rd Battalion 148th Regiment along the Triri Bairoko Trail to hit their southern flank. Strangely, he also expected air bombing missions to be carried out against the enemy, but appears to have requested the important air support too late for it to be carried out. On the morning of July 20th, Liver's Edge thus cleared Anogai and began his march along the Bairoko Anogai Trail in column, with a platoon also moving down the Leland Lagoon sand spit to cover the extreme right flank. At the same time, the 148th soldiers departed Triri in an arduous march inland. Shortly after 10, Colonel Griffith's raiders stumbled upon some Japanese outposts forward of the main defensive line, which would be quickly reduced by the attackers. The advance would then continue, facing ever-increasing resistance, until the Americans were stopped by machine gun fire around noon. Against them, Commander Okamura Saburo had established four successive lines of mutually supporting log and coral pillboxes on low parallel ridges running north to south. This forced Liver's Edge to commit the 4th Raiders on Griffith's left, yet progress would nonetheless remain slow, while the number of losses was rising. Additionally, the platoon on the sand spit was held up by a number of machine guns, 
and was unable to reach the mainland to make contact with Livesedge's main body. By 1430, one of Griffith's companies finally managed to break into the first defence lines. An hour later, however, Okamura began laying down heavy and accurate mortar fire from the ridges back to Livesedge's headquarters, pushing back the Americans, turning the area into a killing field, and successfully inflicting heavy casualties. Unable to move forward, lacking any reserves, and without the aid of proper support, Livesedge's only hope was for the 148th to break through from the south. But after some 3,000 yards of marching, the 3rd Battalion had swung north, only to be stopped by a Japanese blocking position on high ground. By 1600, Livesedge learned of this, and consequently decided to withdraw east to high ground. Starting from the left of the line, the raiders pulled back company by company, and although machine gun and mortar fire still hit them, the withdrawal would be made in good order. By nightfall, Livesedge's forces would finally establish defensive positions near the south shore of Leland Lagoon, having suffered around 200 casualties during the engagement. The following morning, the withdrawal to Inogai began at last, covered by a strong airstrike against Bairocco. Exhausted and depleted, Livesedge's forces would then be ordered to sit tight and hold their positions at Inogai, Triri and Rice Anchorage. At the same time, Sasaki would keep the 2nd Battalion 45th Regiment at Bairocco for the duration of the fighting on New Georgia, as Bairocco was an important storage area with tons of supplies that had been brought in by sea trucks. In the meantime, after the Battle of Kolombangara, Admiral Samajima had formed the Night Battle Unit under Admiral Nishimura in an effort to smash American interference with the transports. With Rear Admiral Ijuin Matsuji now commanding the reinforcement unit, the Japanese were about to carry out a supply run on July 17th when a strong American airstrike fell upon Buin, successfully sinking the destroyer Hatsuyuki and inflicting heavy damage on Ijuin's transports. On the night of July 19th, Nishimura would try once again to bring supplies and reinforcements to New Georgia, but the Japanese would be intercepted while en route, this time by six TBFs that managed to sink the destroyer Yagure and that heavily damaged the cruisers Kamano and Chokai. More strikes were then launched against the Japanese convoy, further sinking the destroyer Kiyonami and damaging the other vessels. Although 582 men, 102 tons of ammunition and supplies, and 60 drums of fuel were successfully delivered, the cost had been high for the Japanese, so the night battle unit plan would soon be abandoned. On July 22nd, another reinforcement convoy, this time to Bougainville, and under Rear Admiral Asugi Murakazu, would be intercepted by a huge strike force. As a result, the seaplane tender Nishin would be repeatedly hit by American bombs and torpedoes, and would sink some 14 minutes after the start of the attack. Of the 1,263 men on board at the time, only 178 were rescued by the escorting destroyers, their efforts severely hampered by renewed air attacks. Despite this considerable loss for the Japanese, General Imamura continued to commit troops for the defense of the Central Solomons, this time assigning the elite Yano Battalion to reinforce Vila. Departing Rabaul aboard three destroyers on the night of July 23rd, the Japanese convoy would avoid the slot by using Wilson Strait to make port at Ariel. At the same time, Admiral Merrill was coming up the slot with a powerful task group to supply Livesedge at Inogai. Luckily for the Japanese, Merrill failed to intercept the enemy convoy, thus allowing the Japanese to unload most of the Yano Battalion before retiring the way they had come. Next week, we'll head out to New Guinea and the North Pacific, as General Savige's forces resume their offensive against Salamawa, and as the Japanese carry out a bold evacuation run towards Kiska. So to make sure you do not miss when that video goes live, subscribe and press the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently, we have started releasing weekly Patreon and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.